Chapter twenty eight of Black Oxen by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter twenty eight. He called for Madame Zattiani at ten o'clock. This time she was standing in the hall as the man opened the door, and she came out immediately. A lace scarf almost concealed her face. I didn't order the car, she said. It is such a fine night and she lives so near do you mind i much prefer to walk but your slippers they are dark and the heels not too high i'm not going to make the slightest preliminary attempt at indifference to-night nor wait for one of your leads how long do you intend to stay at this party oh an hour possibly one must not be rude her own tones were not even but he could not see her face but you'll keep your word and tell me everything to-night she gave a deep sigh yes i'll keep my word no more now please tell me what do they do at these parties besides talk dance not always they have charades spelling matches pick a word out of a hat and make impromptu speeches but mon dieu she stopped short and pushed back her scarf whatever expression she may have wished to conceal there was nothing now in her face but dismay but you did not tell me this or i should not have accepted i never bore myself i understood these were your intellectuals charades spelling matches words in a hat it sounds like a small town moved to new york well a good many of them are from small towns and they rather pride themselves on preserving some of the simplicities of rural life and juvenescence while leading an exaggerated mental life for which nature designed no man perhaps it is merely owing to an obscure warning to preserve the balance or an innocent arrogance akin to mrs oglethorpe's when she is looking her dowdiest but gora often has good music still if you don't want to go on i'm sure i do not no she said hurriedly i shall go but i am still astonished i do not know what i expected but brilliant conversation probably such as one hears in a european salon don't they relax their great minds at outdoor sports i understand there are golf links and tennis courts near the city a good many of them do but they like to relax still further at night you see we are not europeans americans are as serious as children but like children they also love to play remember we are a young nation and a very healthy one and you will have conversation if you want it the men you may be sure will be ready to give you anything you demand i had rather hoped to listen is this the house several taxis were arriving and there were many cars parked along the block when they entered the house they were directed to dressing rooms on the second floor and clavering met madame zattiani at the head of the staircase she wore a gown of emerald green velvet cut to reveal the sloping line of her shoulders and an emerald comb thrust sideways in the low coil of her soft ashen hair on the dazzling fairness of her neck lay a single unset emerald depending from a fine gold chain clavering stared at her helplessly it was evident she had not made her toilette with an eye to softening a blow am i overdressed she murmured i did not know i thought i would dress as if well as if i had been invited by one of my own friends quite right to dress down would have been fatal and gora must spend a small fortune on her clothes but you-you i have never seen you i'm fond of green she said lightly couleur d'esperance shall we go down he followed her down the stairs and before they reached the crowded room below he had managed to set his face but his heart was pounding he gave gora who came forward to meet them a ferocious scowl but she was too much engaged with madame zattiani to notice him and so for that matter was the rest of the company miss dwight's gown was of black satin painted with flaming poinsettias and clavering saw madame zattiani give it a swift approving glance 
Around her thin shoulders was a scarf of red tulle that warmed her brown cheeks. She looked remarkably well, almost handsome, and her strange pale eyes were very bright. It was evident that she was enjoying her triumphs. This, no doubt, was the crowning one, and she led Madame Zattiany into the room, leaving Clavering to his own devices. It was certainly the distinguished party he had promised. There were some eight or ten of the best-known novelists and story-writers in the country, two dramatists, several of the younger publishers, most of the young editors, critics, columnists, and illustrators, famous in New York at least, a few poets, artists, the more serious contributors to the magazines and reviews, an architect, an essayist, a sculptress, a famous girl librarian of a great private library, three correspondents of foreign newspapers, and two visiting British authors. The men wore evening dress. The women, if not all patrons of the ranking houses and dressmakers, were correct. Even the artistic gowns stopped short of delirium. And if many of the women wore their hair short, so did all of the men. Everybody in the room was reasonably young, or had managed to preserve the appearance and spirit of youth. Clavering noticed at once that Mr. Dinwiddie was not present. No doubt he had been ordered to keep out of the way. Miss Dwight led Madame Zattiani to the head of the room and enthroned her, but made no introductions at the moment. A young man stood by the piano, violin in hand, evidently waiting for the stir over the guest of honour to subside. The hostess gave the signal, and the guests were polite, if restless. However, the playing was admirable, and Madame Zattiani, at least, gave it her undivided attention. She was, as ever, apparently unconscious of glances veiled and open, but Clavering laid a bet with himself that before the end of the encore, politely demanded, she knew what every woman in the room had on. The violinist retired. Cocktails were passed. There was a surge toward the head of the room. Clavering had dropped into a chair beside the wife of DeWitt Turner, eminent novelist, who, however, called herself in print and out Susan Forbes. She was one of the founders of the Lucy Stone League, stern advocates of the inalienable individuality of woman. Whether you had one adored husband or many, never should that individuality, presumably derived from the male parent, be sunk in any man's. When Susan's husband took his little family travelling, the astonished hotel register read, DeWitt Turner, Susan Forbes, Child and Nurse. Sometimes explanations were wearisome, and when travelling in Europe they found it expedient to bow to prejudice. Several of the Lucy Stoners, however, had renounced Europe for the present, a reactionary government refusing to issue separate passports. You took your husband's name at the altar, didn't you? you are legally married you are then you're no more miss than mister you go to europe as a respectable married woman or you stay at home so they stayed but they would win in the end they always did as for the husbands they were amenable whether they really approved of feministics in extenso or were merely good-natured and indulgent after the fashion of american husbands they were at some pains to conceal all the bright young married women who were doing things however were not lucy stoners advanced as they might be in thought they were mildly sympathetic but rather liked the matronly and possessive prefix and after all what did it matter there were enough tiresome barriers to scale heaven knew this was the age of woman but man, heretofore predominant by right of brute strength and hallowed custom, was cultivating subtlety, and if he feminized while they masculinized, there would be the devil to pay before long. Miss Forbes was a tiny creature, wholly feminine in appearance, and in spite of her public activities, her really brilliant and initiative mind was notoriously dependent upon her big burly husband for guidance and advice in all practical matters when they took a holiday the younger of his children gave him the least trouble for she had a nurse 
he dared not give his wife her ticket in a crowd lest she lose it far less trust her to relieve his burdened mind of any of the details of travel nor even to order a meal nevertheless he invariably and with complete gravity introduced her and alluded to her as susan forbes she even tabooed the miss and he sent a cheque to the league when it was founded his novels had a quality of delicate irony but he avowed that his motto was to live and let live miss forbes was not pretty but she had an expressive original little face and her manners were charming janet oglethorpe was a boor beside her it was doubtful if she had ever been aggressive in manner or rude in her life although she never hesitated to give utterance to the extremest of her opinions or to maintain them to the bitter end when she sometimes sped home to have hysterics on her husband's broad chest she was one of clavering's favourites and the heroine of the comedy he so far rejected she lit a cigarette as the music finished and pinched it into a holder nearly as long as her face but even smoking never interfered with her pleasant rather deprecatory smile it must be wonderful to be an authentic beauty she said wistfully glancing at the solid phalanx of black backs and sleek heads at the other end of the room and she's ravishing of course the men are sleepless about her already do assure me that she is stupid nature would never treat the rest of us so unfairly as to spare brains for that enchanting skull when she hasn't enough to go round as it is i believe i'd give mine to look like that she's anything and everything but stupid ask gora they've already met well there's something she said wisely law of compensation although any woman who can look like that should have a special dispensation of providence are you interested in her clavy immensely but i want to talk to you about another friend of mine and he told her something of anne goodrich her ambitions her talents and her admiration of the new aristocracy susan forbes listened with smiling interest and bobbed her brown little head emphatically splendid i'm having a party on thursday night be sure to bring her she'll need encouragement at first poor thing and i'll be only too glad to advise her i'll tell tommy treadwell to find a studio for her i've an idea there's one vacant in the gainsborough and she'll love the outlook on the park wit can help her furnish he's a wonder at picking up things mother can furnish the kitchenette do you think she'll join the lucy stone league no doubt as she was brought up in the most conservative atmosphere in america she'll leap most of the fences after she takes the first but i don't think she's the marrying kind i shall advise her to marry husbands are almost indispensable in a busy woman's life and there are so many new ways of bringing up a baby do you like my gown it was a charming but not extravagant slip of bright green chiffon and suited her elfishness admirably as he told her i paid for it myself i pay for all my gowns as i think it consistent but i can't afford the expensive dressmakers yet at least i think i've paid for it wit says i haven't and that he expects the collector any day but i must have because i told her to send the bill at once so that it wouldn't get lost among all the other bills on the first of the month your column's been simply spiffing lately full of fire and go but rather what shall i call it explosive what happened clavy good of you to encourage me susanna i thought it rotten what are you working at i've just finished a paper on john dewey for the atlantic i was so proud when wit said he hadn't a criticism to make i'm on a review for the yale now and the new century has asked me for a psychological analysis of the younger generation i'm going to compare our post-war product with all that is known of young people and their manifestations straight back to the stone age i've made a specialty of the subject wit has helped me a lot in research do you think he's gone off gone off certainly not every columnist in town had something to say about that last instalment of his novel best thing he's ever done and that's saying all he's strong as an ox too why in heaven's name should he go off well baby's teething 
and won't let any one else hold her when she gets the fretting spell. He's been up a lot lately. Clavering burst into a loud, delighted laugh. He had forgotten his personal affairs completely, as he always did when talking to this remarkable little paradox. Gad, that's good! And his public visualises him as a sort of Buddha, brooding cross-legged in his library, receiving direct advice from the god of fiction. But I wouldn't have you otherwise. The nineteenth-century blue stocking with twentieth-century trimming. What now? Rollo Landers Todd, the poet of Manhattan, had stalked in with a Prussian helmet on his head, his girth draped in a rich blue shawl embroidered and fringed with white, a bit of frown on his jovial round face, and in his hand a long rod with a large blue bow on the metal point designed to shut refractory windows. Helen Vane Baker, a contribution from society to the art of fiction, with flowing hair and arrayed in a long nightgown over her dress, fortunately white, was assisted to the top of the bookcase on the West Hall. Henry Church, a famous satirist, muffled in a fur coat, a small black silk handkerchief pinned about his lively face, stumped heavily into the room, fell in a heap on the floor against the opposite wall, and in a magnificent bass growled out the resentment of Ortrude while a rising but not yet prosilient pianist with a long blonde wig from miss dwight's property chest threw his head back shook his hands adjusted a cigarette in the corner of his mouth and banged out the prelude to lohengrin with amazing variations elsa with her profile against the wall and her hands folded across her breast sang what of elsa's prayer she could remember and with no apparent effort improvised the rest Lohengrin pranced up and down the room, barking out German phonetics. He did not know a word of the language, but his accent was as Teutonic as his helmet. Demanding vengeance and threatening annihilation. He brandished his pole in the face of Ortrude, stamping and roaring, then, bending his knees, waddled across the room and prodded Elsa, who winced perceptibly but continued to mingle her light soprano with the rolling bass of Mr. Church and the vociferations of the poet. Finally, at the staccato command of Mr. Todd's hoarsening voice, she toppled over into his arms, and they both fell on Ortrude. The nonsense was over. No one applauded more spontaneously than Madame Zattiani, and she even drank a cocktail. By this time, everyone in the room had been introduced to her, and she was chatting as if she hadn't a care in the world. As far as Clavering could see, she had every intention of making a sophisticated night of it. The pianist, after a brief interval for recuperation, played with deafening vehemence and then with excruciating sweetness. Once more cocktails were passed, and then there was a charade by Todd, Susan Forbes, and the handsome young English sculptress, which Madame Zattiani followed with puzzled interest, and was so delighted with herself for guessing the word before the climax that she clapped her hands and laughed like a child. More music, more cocktails, a brief impromptu play full of witty nonsense, caricaturing several of the distinguished company whose appreciation was somewhat dubious, and Miss Dwight led the way down to supper. Clavering watched Madame Zattiani go out with the good-looking young editor of one of the staid old fiction magazines, which he had recently levered out of its rut by the wayside, cranked up and driven with a magnificent gesture into the front rank of youth. She was talking with the greatest animation. He hardly recognised her, and it was apparent that she had entered into the spirit of the evening, quite reconciled to any dearth of intellectual refreshment. The supper of hot oysters, chicken salad, every known variety of sandwich, ices, and cakes, was taken standing for the most part. Madame Zattiani, however, once more enthroned at the head of the room, women as well as men dancing attendance upon her. Prohibition, a dead letter to all who could afford to patronise the underground mart, had but added to the spice of life, and it was patent that Miss Dwight had a cellar. More cocktails, highballs, sherry, were passed continuously, 
and two enthusiastic guests made a punch fashionable young actors and actresses began to arrive hilarity waxed impromptu speeches were made songs rose on every key then suddenly some one ran up to the victrola and turned on the jazz and in a twinkling the dining-room was deserted furniture in the large room upstairs was pushed to the wall and the night entered on its last phase then only did madame zattiany signify her intention of retiring and clavering to whom such entertainments were too familiar to banish for more than a moment his heavy disquiet hastened to her side with a sigh of relief and a sinking sensation behind his ribs madame zattiany made her farewells not only with graciousness but with unmistakable sincerity in her protestations of having passed her most interesting evening in new york miss dwight went up to the dressing-room with her and clavering retrieving hat and topcoat waited for her at the front door she came down radiant and talking animatedly to her hostess but when they had parted and she was alone with clavering her face seemed suddenly to turn to stone and her lips drooped as she was about to pass him she shrank back and then raised her eyes to his in that fleeting moment they looked as when he had met them first inconceivably old wise disillusioned now for it he thought grimly as he closed the door and followed her out to the pavement the lord have mercy and then he made a sudden resolution End of chapter 28